Hey there, everyone. A lot of people think that they're thinking, but they're actually rearranging their ignorance. Think about that for a moment. One of the greatest skills of the 21st century is the skill of critical thinking. Critical thinking has nothing to do with emotions, which are biochemical and primal in nature. It'll surprise you that even if you have a PhD or master's degree, um, it's almost like you were a drop out of life. And what I mean by that is this, that education teaches you what to think, but it doesn't teach you how to think. And this is why the message of the kingdom is so powerful in this day and age. Unfortunately, that primal state that I mentioned earlier is where most people are living. So in this message, The Art of Thinking, I'm exploring the parables of Jesus in order to challenge you how to think. Think about that. The parables taught by Jesus was not just so that you can have a basis for your theology. It's really to allow the Holy Spirit to be like a tour guide to help you to navigate the landscape of your potential and to take you to a place inside yourself that you cannot go by yourself. God wants to take you from primal to powerful. And through the understanding of these parables, you will have the ability to move into new realms of abundance, to rethink life, and to influence change. Let's dig in. Good evening, everyone. I'm excited about this series. And tonight, today, this afternoon, whenever you're viewing this series, I want you to get in a comfortable place. If you're driving, I want you to really listen, but pay attention to what's going on in front of you on the road. Um, those of you that have the opportunity to take copious notes, I want you to really take copious notes and don't let anything or anyone distract you at this moment. Th this message really is gonna be a message that's gonna revolutionize your life. I'm taking my message today out of Matthew 13, three to 13. We're looking at all the parables. And today I want to do a simple treatment on why these parables are important. The book of Matthew chapter 13, three to 13 says, and he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell on stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no dampness in them, or in no dampness of the earth. And when the sun was up, they were scourged, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked, but others fell on good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. And I know a lot of people think that that has to do with whether um, some people are going to get a hundredfold or going to get sixtyfold or going to get thirtyfold. Uh, that is a terminology that simply says, whatever the potential is in that particular seed, whether that seed is a hundredfold, that seed will pro produce a hundredfold. If there's a seed that has the invisible programming within its DNA to produce 60-fold, that's what it's going to produce. So every seed has within itself a hidden um, programming that determines the kind of harvest. And this is why the type of seed is important. But it goes on to say, verse number nine, whoever has an ear, let him hear. And uh, the disciples came and said unto him, why speaketh thou to them uh, in parables? And he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that which you've had, even that which that he hath. You've heard of the saying, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So this is a great example of it. 
what you receive is determined by what you have. And we're not talking about something that is temporal. We're not talking about money. We're not talking about houses and land. We're talking about whoever has the ability to understand these teachings, whoever has the revelation that um, Christ is preach preaching about, then he'll put his increase on autopilot. Now, I know personally that I love my increase to be on autopilot. I love my success to be on autopilot. I would absolutely love my wealth to be on autopilot. I will love my blessings to be an autopilot. And this is important. So as he begins to teach on the message of the kingdom, he wants them to understand how valuable this message is. The scripture says, therefore spake I to them in parables. Here it is. He wants you to be, to have full understanding, full comprehension. He wants you to have a kingdom mentality because your success depends on it. Your, your progress depends on it. Your wealth depends on it. Your growth depends on it. Everything is going to rise and fall on your understanding of the kingdom. The Bible said, I spoke to them in parables because they seeing not and they seeing see not and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. So how can someone see and not see, and how, could, how can someone hear and not hear? Well, it's very simple to me. Uh, when we talk to someone and we really want them to understand, we usually say, do you see what I'm saying? So to see means, do you fully comprehend? And this is not just comprehension. It's comprehension of a revelation that you receive as a rhema word so that you have immediate application. A person who really understands truth usually applies it and you'll see the proof in their life. But it's a difference when you understand a word, but not the context. And this is where a lot of arguments happen, a lot of debates where you might be in a conversation and you're talking to someone and you're debating and you're arguing, arguing back and forward about the words and you're, you're arguing about the semantics. And the person would say, well, that's not what I meant. And you're going to argue, that's what I said. So that means that your context is going to be important. And this is the dividing factor between religious Christians and those that are kingdom citizens. No one said that one person is not more saved than the other, but one person is going to have more manifestations of the promises that God has because they not only have the understanding and conceptualization of a word, but they understand it based on the context. So everywhere Jesus went, he preached the message of the kingdom. And I tell you, when it comes to the message of the kingdom, a lot of people don't understand the word kingdom. And I'm going to be breaking it down as we introduce you to the parables. But for all intents and purposes, when we talk about the preaching of the message of the kingdom, the message of the kingdom is a message that Christ preached. And it is a message of empowerment that gives meaning, hope, dignity, and purpose, not just for Christians, but for all humanity. It'd be interesting if governments embrace the teachings of Christ. And it'll be interesting if other religions embrace the Christians of Christ. In fact, it was a statement that um, uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi had made back in the day um, he loved the message of Christ, but he didn't really care for the Christians. Why? Because we were preaching one thing, but we were not living it. And if we can just bridge the gap between what we say and what we do, I believe that we would be great influencers, influencers in the world, influencers amongst our friends, influence, influencers in our business, influencers in the business arena and the professional arena. You would see that we would become more influential if we understood that we should walk the walk and talk the talk, not only talk the talk, but uh, walk the walk as well. He said, well, the reason why they're not able to live in this realm of abundance and abundance is yours is because there is uh, the hearing 
without comprehension. And a lot of people live a life that is frustrated and frustration because they are doing everything they believe that the Bible is telling them to do, but yet they don't see the manifestation. And I've concluded, I've made this one conclusion based on where I was at the beginning stages of my Christianity and where I am now, the difference is me not only believing, but applying. So the greatest challenge of the church today is not the conversion of sinners to be Christians, but Christians to become believers. The Bible said that there's going to be a performance of those things that are believed. And so uh, if you want to see your life in alignment with those promises that he has, and there's approximately 75 categories of promises, and within those promises, there are hundreds that 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 God has left for uh, the uh, humanity, period. And those of us that are believers, we should see the manifestation and we should see it in rapid fashion. And so the message that Jesus preached was a message of empowerment. And that message of empowerment was taught to his disciples and all that was listening. We all know uh, him going up in the mountain and uh, teaching or preaching the Beatitudes. We all know about that. Uh, but did everyone who heard him teach on these things, did they leave the mountaintop experience go back down in the valley or go back to their usual life? Did they apply it? Did they live it? And the proof is always in the pudding. And so from that time in Matthew chapter 4, 17, after the temptation of Christ, the Bible said that he was, he, he was tempted by malevolent forces, which who we call the devil. And he was tempted at the level of his thoughts. And I want you to write that down. Because the highest form of spiritual warfare is the counsel of the human mind by any other spirit other than the spirit of the Lord. And this is going to be very important because a lot of people live at the level of their emotions. And if you are being attacked at the level of your mind, that means one is spiritual and the other is biochemical and bioelectrical. So your emotions, you, the reason why you feel emotions or you have feelings is because of the biochemical reaction to something that you have interpreted. So that means that when Jesus was preaching the message of the kingdom, he wanted to give them context so that they can live an empowered life, so that they can interpret what it was going on in the world, not from the lenses of culture or the prevailing culture, uh, but from the lenses of the kingdom, which had its own culture. And so it means that there was a revolution that had to go on and it was the revolution of our thinking. And so as I set this up uh, from out of Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As I set this up, I want to uh, address you today, um, and in this this particular uh, message on a crash a crash course in thinking, a crash course in thinking. A lot of people that they think that they're thinking when in fact they're not. They're being controlled by the prevailing culture that is characterized by uh, conspiracy theories, propaganda, ideologies that are contrary to humanity. When Jesus came, he wanted to restore our humanity. The scripture says he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Not who was lost, but that which was lost. And I want to float that as a balloon. I'm going to come, come back because our series is really going to challenge you at the level of your thinking. And I want to go line by line, precept upon precept, as we introduce you to kingdom thinking in this series or this particular um, section of our teaching, which is a crash course in thinking. A lot of people think they're thinking, but they're actually just rearranging their ignorance. And we have to be careful, even as believers, 
that we are not rearranging our ignorance, that we are not being controlled by a prevailing culture at the expense of our intellect, at the expense of our intelligence, as at, at the expense of our God-likeness. And our God-likeness is demonstrated many ways, but primarily in our thought life, how we think. When God created humanity, he gave him the ability to think. There was no box. He was the innovator of boxes. And so if you think outside of a box, that means that the box is still your reference. And this is why a lot of people are going through life as Christians, and they're really, really frustrated because they're thinking outside of a box and they are not knowing that that box is still their reference, so they really have not been liberated in their mind. Philippians 4, 8, and 9 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have learned and received and heard and seen of me, seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So this is very important because Jesus, going back to our text, was able to say, in seeing, they don't see, and in hearing, they don't hear. In other words, they're able to hear words, which the average person does, but they have no critical thinking. A crash course in thinking, the parables were preached or taught to the disciples to open up their mind, to remove restrictions from off of their mind so that they can think like God. So you and I, we could think like God. We can think creatively. We could think innovatively. And we no longer are thinking outside of the box. What we're doing is creating new boxes, new, new paradigms, new methodologies, new philosophies, new ideologies. The scripture says in Philippians 2 and 5, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And so if you want to know the mentality of an individual, if you want to understand the psychology of a person, listen to their speech, listen to their words. Why? Because their speech and words will betray them. And it's interesting because a lot of times we get disappointed, especially if people make promises, we get disappointed if they uh, don't make good on their promise or if someone lies to us or someone betrays us, we get all upset. Last night when I was preparing for that, I was listening to an interview, um, DMX, and DMX says, look, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people say they don't trust anymore, but it, that's too much energy to say, oh, I don't trust this person or I don't trust that person. It's too much negative energy. You need to trust everyone. And so the interviewer was interviewing him and, you know, kind of confused. How could you say you trust everyone if, uh, if people are not trustworthy? And he began to break it down. He said, look, think of it this way. If you saw a snake, you can trust that snake. You're going to trust that that snake is going to bite you. And if you see a lion, you're going to trust that that lion is going to destroy you, eat you, kill you. And so when a person shows you who they are, trust them. And I thought that's so brilliant because now it puts a, a different kind of spin on the word trust. And a lot of us as Christians, we don't even trust the process that God brings us through because we, we, we are so our mindsets and our thoughts actually have been pre-programmed by a counter culture. It is the kingdom of darkness. It is not the kingdom of light. The kingdom of light is a kingdom of empowerment. It's a kingdom of wisdom. It's a kingdom of strategy. It's a kingdom of wealth. It's a kingdom of empowerment. The kingdom of darkness will hold you in ignorance. To be in the dark is to be ignorant concerning something. And my concern is this, that today we have so many people that are educated, but they are non thinkers. Again, we think that we're thinking, but we're just moving around our ignorance. We're rearranging our ignorance to fit some propaganda or to, to, to fit something that um, is being used to control us. 
And there's so much, so much conspiracy theory that is running around this weekend. Someone sent, sent something to me that was supposed to be from someone that was in authority. And I ripped straight through their, um, thesis. Their thesis was built on fallacy. And, you know, everyone was afraid and this is an authority, an authority on what? And I began to realize how important this message is because we have lost our ability to think critically. We have not only lost our ability to think critically, and let me backtrack for a moment. What do you mean? Well, a critical think thinker is not going to take anything at face value. They're going to raise questions. And this is why I love the teachings of the parables, because the parables were structured in such a way that it didn't give you answers. It built capacity in your thinking process so that you can ask questions. The parables were ponderables. It was something that was meant for you to walk away, ask questions, and ponder on it. And the thing about the living in the kingdom is this, that we are encouraged to ask questions. And asking questions helps uh, us to be restored in uh, God's original way or restored back to God's original way of, of, cre of uh, or original, original um, idea to create man as thinking beings. So we're restored back to a mindset and a psychology that we are not victims of circumstances. Life is not happening to any of us. We are happening to life. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So uh, if I were to observe the average person's life, I could t basically tell you what they're thinking. Because everything that we think eventually manifests in our lives, but no one wants to take responsibility. So we blame it on the devil. We blame it on our ex-wife. We blame it on government. We blame it on our boss. It's this whole big blame game going on because people quite frankly are afraid to think for themselves. The thing about slavery is not the physical bondage. The travesty about slavery is the mental bondage. You see, you could throw a man in prison and he'd still be free. Why? Because he's free in his mind. And that is a Nelson Mandela story. 27 years in prison. And he decided that he was going to come out, release everyone, and forgive everyone that had, had ever uh, released propaganda about him, that he was... Uh, uh, he was um, a terrorist and everything else they said about him. And he came out and forgave them and the rest is history. The same culture that oppressed him, he eventually shifted that culture because he became the first man of color to be the president of South Africa. And it's interesting because when we, when we think about the mind, we don't think about how powerful the mind is. Your mind is not your brain. We have this saying, mind over matter. And that means that you don't have to be um, an individual that knee jerks at life. You can be a vict victor, you don't have to be a victim. You can live the life of your dreams because every single day you get a chance to choose what you think on. Again, as a man, as a woman thinketh in her heart, so is he or she. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, 16, for who had the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. One scripture says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. We have the mind of Christ. And so how do we set this up today? How do we communicate to you that these parables are important for you to understand? Because each parable gives you a crash course in the art of thinking. Because if you can think, you can think your way out of anything and into anything. As long as you have control of your thoughts, nothing externally will control you. The government can't, the economy can't, 
That means that you consent to participate or you can decide not to participate. I remember a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, we had the gas shortage and everyone was running around. And I was saying to my husband, listen, we always have gas shortages, shortages, shortages. And I don't care why they say there's a gas shortage, uh, they need to get us spending. So they're gonna get you spending. It's a part of propaganda, isn't it? To create a feeling that there's a lack so that everyone can rush and buy. It's a pro part of propaganda. And then a couple of days later, all of a sudden, we have all the gas available. I remember with the economic downturn in 2008, where the bubble busted and everybody was running around and they were afraid and I decided not to participate. And that is because I have the ability to think for myself. So in any kind of conversation, you don't have to be controlled by someone's opinion. And it's a problem that we're having today because of social media. People sit on other people's timeline, they sit on social media trying to figure out what people think about them, but what do you think about yourself? What people feel about them, what, what do you feel about yourself? One of Jesus Christ's go-to teaching tools was parables. One of the things that James L. Fowler said, he called them uh, pictorial ponderables. And I was pondering on pictorial ponderables, and I understood what it meant. You do not think in words. Most people think that they think in words, but they don't think in words. You don't think in words. You think in images, and then if you wanna communicate your thoughts, you try to communicate it with words. And this is why wordsmithing is important. This is why you have to understand what uh, advertisers are doing and marketing uh, marketers are doing. What they're doing is they wanna paint a picture in your mind, especially when it comes to uh, spending. They wanna paint a picture in your mind so that that image that comes up is attached to a, the driving force the psychology of your, your buying, and that picture comes up so that you can see yourself living in it, you could see yourself driving it, you could see yourself wearing it, you could see yourself running in it, and it's all based on words. Now, if I communicate with you, there are pictures that go, are going on in my mind, images that are going on in my mind, and what I do is use the secondary conduit, and that is words. And so if I'm using the, this conduit, now I've got to paint a picture in your mind. And so this is why stories, a picture is worth a thousand words. This is why we are storytellers. And Jesus was a master at storytelling because they were designed to give deeper understanding to those that were hearing and listening of what this kingdom was all about. Uh, what the benefits of the kingdom was, how to understand the kingdom. And quite frankly, it is still a mystery today. The average person, if you ask them, what is the kingdom of heaven? They're going to give you, I don't know what they're going to give you, but oftentimes people hear it, they, they speak it, but they don't have an understanding of it. Because if your concept is wrong, your conclusion is going to be wrong. Whenever he taught, he taught with authority. He, pro he proclaimed the truth. And he just wanted his disciples and the people that were listening to really get it. And so all of the parables that he spoke, it, they're diverse. Um, but they were formulated to give a clear definition of each of the parables, which were sometimes very complex and very difficult. Now, Jesus used the Arist uh, Aristolian and the um, Socratic method of teaching. And the Socratic method of teaching is a brilliant way of, of, of building intellectual muscles in, in his teachers. And what he would do, he would pose different kinds of scenarios and then ask them uh, to uh, come to a conclusion. And 
uh, he would present it in such a way, this is the teachings of Socrates, he would present it in such a way that they left with more questions than answers. And as long as people are giving you all the answers, you will never become an intellect. You will never understand how to think for yourself. And why is this important? It is important because the educational system, the current educational system has done a disservice to humanity. It doesn't matter whether you have a BA, a master's, a PhD, or you're a dropout. If you have been through the typical educational institution, which is all of us, all of us have been through the educational institution. All of us have been taught what to think, but not how to think. And herein lies the problem. Because if you are in an environment that makes you think, it's easy to be frustrated because we, we are trained to have other people thinking for us. And if you're in an environment that demands that you think, it can be the most frustrating thing when you want people to tell you what to think. It could be frustrating. But when Jesus taught the parables, he wasn't teaching them what to think, he was teaching them how to think. And so in the simplest understanding that I received, as I begin to study the importance of the parables, parables are the usage of metaphors and similes that are drawn from nature, from everyday common life, uh, that arrests the intellect of the hearer because it's such a strange parallel. Here you're teaching about the kingdom and then you throw in an example about a woman making bread or you're teaching about the kingdom and you're talking about seed in the ground or you're teaching about the kingdom and you're, you, you throw in an example or a parable about someone fishing. And what does fishing have to do with the kingdom? And what does uh, making bread have to do with the kingdom? And what does uh, seed have to do with the kingdom? And all this aggression uh, parables, the parable of the wheat and the tears and the parable of a light under the bushel and the parable of the uh, man who gave money to people and all of these parables. Can you just tell us? And the answer is no. Why? Because if someone thinks for you, they insult your intelligence. And the moment your intelligence is insulted, the moment they strip you of the thing that makes you like God, and that's your ability not to think outside of the box, the ability to create a box so that you bring to the table problem solving strategies. So he wanted them to be problem solvers, not just preachers, not just people that hung out in the temple. He wanted them to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Again, the gospel is not just Jesus saved. The gospel is a message that gives meaning and hope, dignity and purpose to all humanity. And I believe that every one of us could use an extra dose of meaning, an extra dose of purpose, an extra dose of dignity. We could all use an extra dose of it because if you have that, you will live in the realm of abundance. You will know no lack. And if you can understand this, if, I, if, if you don't understand anything else that I'm saying, as I lay the foundation to teach about the parables, to teach about the parables, it, it means that you have the ability to move into new realms of greatness. That this could technically be the ending of you living in obscurity. And the back, in the back, Back in the dark, in the corner, in the booth. You can come out, you can come out strong, and you can influence change within your family, within your community, within your industry, wherever you are, you can be an influencer. And you know, I, I think of all the people that lived as individuals but died as an institution. I think of Prada, Gucci, all of these uh, individuals that, that made the world 
a different place and a better place. And they lived as individuals, but they die as institutions. And I believe that that's what God wants for you. He wants you, yes, to live as an ind individual, but another generation should know that you lived. History should not be allowed to um, uh, erase you out of the annals of time where greatness and great acts were recorded by man who had the uncommon ability to think differently. And so these parables were spoken firstly. Why parables? Firstly, I believe it was a tool that Jesus used to take people into a place within themselves that they could not go by themselves. And I'm going to say it again. When Jesus spoke the parables, it gave the Holy Spirit an opportunity to be a tour guide. Not for them to tour the landscape outside of them, but to, 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 to tour the landscape inside of them. Why is it important? It is important to understand this because the kingdom of heaven is not outside of you. The kingdom of heaven is within you. It is a way of life. It is a paradigm. It's the way that you, it's your modus operandi. It's inside of you. So when he spoke the parables, it gave God, it gave the Holy Spirit to become a tour guide, to, to take them within themselves to a place where they could not go by themselves. So let me break it down even further. Why would Jesus preach the parable? Why would he teach the parable? Why is it important for all believers to understand the importance of the parable. The parables, once you read them, allows the Holy Spirit to take you into a place within yourself that you cannot go by yourself. Philippians 2 and 5 says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So Jesus preached the message of the kingdom and he preached it in such a way that it assisted in helping the hearers to understand the complexity of who they were as kingdom citizens. Solomon says something. He said, I saw something incredible. He said, I saw princes walking and I saw servants riding on horses. And this is what's happening. There is something in you that is telling you every single day that you're bigger, you're better, you deserve to have more. And you feel it. Sometimes you're afraid to speak it. But when a person treats you in a way that is incongruent with how you feel about yourself, you become offended. And instead of allowing that negative energy to, to um, roll in your body and in your mind and turn it into bitterness, people get offended. And if the offense is not... Um, it is not dealt with, it turns into bitterness and bitterness turns into arthritis is one of the contributing factors of, un, of, of, of arthritis. And, um, it's, it's, it's not the, it's not the, uh, medical, but it is an emotional contributing factor. And a lot of people end up offended and, and, and without the strategy for dealing with the offense. So I, I want to teach you something and this mindset. If you would just take the offense, which is just a feeling. And the reason why the average person never succeeds is because every decision that they make is driven by feelings. It's driven by emotions. A crash course in thinking. Thinking has nothing to do with your emotions. And as long as you are allowing uh, your emotions to dictate to a decision that you're making, you will always be a victim of circumstance. You will have no control over your life. If you want to take the person, your personal power back, you need, to, you need to learn how to manage your emotions. Feel your emotions, that's fine. But never do anything with your emotions. It's like uh, dating to me. How many of you have ever been madly in love and then you ended up marrying this person that you were madly in love with and after a couple of weeks or a couple of months they got on your last nerve and you asked this question, what was I thinking? Well, well, maybe you weren't. 
Maybe it was just emotions. There's a song that says, it's just my emotions slipping away from me. If you don't want to uh, go through life responding from a primal state, write this down. God wants to take you from primal to powerful. He is not giving you power just so that you can feel the power. He's giving you power over your emotions, power to create wealth. He's giving you power over the enemy. He's giving you power. And you can live in a state of power, power for the rest of your life as long as you understand that if you respond from your primal state, you are going to always be controlled by external um, forces of control and people. When you see something, how do you, how do you think about an offense? How do you think about offense? Firstly, you recognize that when you feel offended, it's attached to your core values. So what you need to do is to go all the way back, scale back, think about your core values. And rather than being offended by something that a person did or didn't do, or being offended by something that a person said or didn't say, rather than be offended, I, I, what I want you to do is go all the way back. And what you do is values clarification. It was your responsibility to clearly communicate your values. Nobody around you should have to play a guessing game. So as long as you understand this, that you are not a victim of circumstances, stuff is not happening to you. And the reason why there are adversities and problems, there are, are um, disappointments, it has nothing to do with the emotions. What God is doing is uh, uh, allowing you to go into yourself and allow the Holy Spirit to take you into yourself and places in yourself that you do not have the ability to go by yourself. And I'm hoping that you get this. So the next time someone hurts you, the next time someone rejects you, the next time someone betrays you, the next time someone lies on you, what I want you to do is take a deep breath. I want you to stop. You are no longer going to be controlled by your emotions. Your emotions is an internal thing. I can't feel them for you. But a lot of times they are processed through what I call the fl fatal flaw of humanity. And the fatal flaw happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam gave his power away to Satan and he lost his ability to think. He lost his ability to think. And when you look at that story, you see this big blame game. Well, Adam, why did you? Because the woman. And all of us are guilty of projecting. We project our, uh, our maladaptive sets of behavior, behavior and responses. We project that onto others. And I, I've, I've seen it so many times where people don't want to take 100% responsibility because I, I've been in um, settings where someone makes a joke and everybody's laughing and one person is offended. And I thought the other day, why would they be offended? Everybody else is laughing. It is because of what's going on on the inside of them. The Bible says that it's not what comes into a man, it's what goes out of a man. It's the state of a person's heart. And so if we begin to deal with our thought life and our, and, and our mindset and begin to understand that every single day things occur to us because they first flow through us and then they come to us. As a man thinketh in his heart, so if you run around and think that everybody doesn't like you and everybody's not going to like you, guess what? That's your perception of it. But if you can just, if you can just harness your thought life and understand how 
much of your creative genius is going to waste and your intelligence is going to waste because you become an emotional mess. Everything that happens to you, you are trying to interpret it through your emotions. Well, I feel. Well, feelings come and go. I didn't feel like getting up this morning because I was, I stayed up late last night, but that was a decision that I made. And did I get up? Absolutely. Why? Because I'm not subject to be controlled by my feelings. I have to think through things. I have to process things at a higher level. So many people think that they're thinking, but unfortunately, they are merely rearranging their ignorance. And I want you to write that down. We are told that we must think outside of the box. And again, as long as you're thinking outside of the box and the box in this, in this, in this series is culture, then culture always becomes your reference point. But if we can get you to think outside of the kingdom or use the kingdom as, as a reference point, if we can get you to pivot in this season, if we can get you to change the way that you think, you will begin to see some amazing things happening in your life. When Adam fell, the first man, he didn't lose his ability to think. What he lost was his ability to think like God. He lost his ability to think about the opportunities and to think differently about opportunities. He lost his ability to think differently about failure. Most people, if they fail, they consider themselves a failure, but that's not your identity. And what God is doing is restoring our ability to think so that you think about opportunities differently. You think about failure differently. You think about betrayal differently. You think about the kingdom differently, success, prosperity, mentorship, purpose, legacy, all those things. You want to think differently. And that's what understanding the kingdom is going to do for you. You're going to think about God differently. You're going to think about salvation, your worship. You're going to think about your disappointments, everything you're going to think differently because perspective is everything. And when you understand that every, every, everything in life, all of our life experiences is about perspective, is your perspective. If you put 10 people in a room, everyone's going to have a different perspective. So it is with the kingdom. What, what, what God wants to do is to use these parables so that the Holy Spirit, you allow the Holy Spirit to take you into a place in yourself that you cannot go by yourself. This is what the parables are all about. The parables is not for you to just run around as a theologian and teach it. If, if, if you have not allowed those parables to sink in to your subconscious mind, to create a paradigm shift, to remove um, limitations uh, that are self-imposed or culturally imposed, to enlarge your territory, to help you to think bigger, you have missed the purpose for teaching the parables. Perspectives are everything. And I'm going to say it again. I'm going to keep hammering it. The parables were taught so that it would give God and the Holy Spirit an opportunity to become your tour guide so that they can take you into yourself to a place where you cannot go by yourself. He's your creator. And if culture has molded your mindset, that means that you're not thinking like yourself. God is going to take you to dimensions in yourself that you cannot go by yourself. He's going to take you into dimensions in yourself that you cannot go by yourself. How do I know it? I know it because the average person thinks more about what other people are thinking and what government is doing and who's doing what and propaganda. And this is what they talk about 24 seven. And when it comes down to asking people, well, what do you think about? They're going to quote something that someone else is, it has thought. And when I think about it, I think about Jabez. Jabez was rejected by his mother and his community. And neither his family or community imagined him doing anything else but being 
a pain in the butt, because that's what his name means. The one that brings pain. Can you imagine people calling your name and they don't expect anything from you? And somewhere in his prayer, God took him in himself to a place that he could not go by himself. And he prays this prayer, enlarge my territory. Give me the, the ability to think bigger because we rise to the level of people's expectations. And a lot of times, if you're rising to people's expectation, sometimes it's, it's with frustration. And if people are able to see potential in you that you cannot see in yourself, and when they put you in an environment, and then they set the um, measuring rod, not to the level of your performance, but to the level of your potential, Many of us have never had the opportunity because most people don't expect much from you. And this is why you have supervisors. When you go on a job and they give you a supervisor is because they already are saying to you, I cannot trust you. But if you are in a position where people are saying, go for it, here are the goals. I know you have it in you. And that frustrates you. You know something is wrong. You know that you are being controlled by the prevailing culture that accepts mediocrity as a performance level. But if you can ever understand that living in this kingdom is about excellence and that if someone is raising the bar, they're raising the bar because they believe in you. When I think of God using parables to take us into a place in ourselves that we cannot go by ourselves. I think of Jacob. Jacob was a brilliant man. He was, he, he, he was, he was, uh, he was honorable. He was a man of integrity, but check this out. His twin brother was jealous. His twin brother encouraged people and convinced people that his brother was this manipulator, but God saw something different. God said, uh, Esau have I hated, <laughs> Jacob have I, do I love. In other words, I prefer him. Why? Because man look on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Have you ever been in a place where people misunderstood you and where they called you one thing, but you know you weren't that thing? Have you ever been to that place? I say, look, don't argue with them. That's their opinion of you. What do you feel about yourself? The parables are taught to take you into a place within yourself that you cannot go by yourself. Jacob had to wrestle. The Bible said that he wrestled with this angel. And when he came out, he came out where this angel actually introduced Israel to Jacob and said, Jacob, this is who you really are. You have, raised, you have risen to the standard. You have been hitting your head on this invisible uh, lid. And people don't expect you to perform at any other level. And it's like, even if you try to tell them, well, that's not me, nobody believed, because your brother has done a good job in planting negativity in the hearts of people that you're working with so that everywhere you go, this bad reputation is following you and you know that that's not you and you're proving to your uncle, listen, uh, you know, I I'm going to prove to you that I'm this good person. He had to prove to his father he's a good person everywhere he went. And finally, the Holy Spirit took him to a place in himself that he couldn't go by himself. And when he came out, he went in as Jacob, but he came out as Israel. And so this is the intent of the parables. I could think about Jabez. I could think about Jacob. I could think how God changed Sarai's name to Sarah, Abram's name to Abraham. Gideon was a general, but he was hiding um, within the culture. And it was a culture of oppression. And he was just getting by. And he had this encounter and God took him into himself into a place that he couldn't go by himself. 
And after God got through with him, he was a general. I could think about Esther. I could think about Moses. I could think about Gideon. I could think about Jephthah. Jephthah ended up in gangbanging because his brothers, his half brothers hated him. I could think about David where he's this um, child from an extramarital one night stand. And the mother says, I don't want you. So the father took him home. And when he took him home for the rest of his life, all of his brothers reminded him that you are half brother. And I want to use a word, but I'm not going to use the word, but he lived with that until one day God introduced him to himself, anointed him and caused a uh, Goliath, this, this, um, uh, giant caused this terrorist attack to show up just when he was in service. And he was the only one that can solve the nation's terrorist attack. Why? Because he was called to be the king. And this was an introdu introduction to his destiny. A lot of times we're given opportunities to solve problems uh, within the workplace, to solve problems within our family, and we end up being bitter. We end up being, you know, we say dumb stuff like, I ain't getting paid for this. But a lot of times what God is using, these situations and circumstances, disasters, rejection, all of that to take you to a place in yourself that you cannot go by yourself. And so the parables were meant to expose the strongholds, the faulty belief systems, the self-imposed or the culturally imposed limitations and lids, the defense mechanisms um, that prohibits us from becoming everything we have the potential of being. And I'm hoping that you get that. It's not about the betrayal of Joseph, but who he became as a result. He was able to say, look, that betrayal took me to a place in myself that I could not go by myself. And God used it as a refining process because it was never about his brothers. It was about Joseph. It was about his destiny. Stop making everything about everybody else. Stop looking at what's wrong and what they said and what they, how they hurt you. Stop. If you are going to be great in this kingdom, firstly, you got to understand what comes to you first comes through you. What comes to you first flows through you. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Thoughts are things. And if you could just change your thoughts, all this stuff that is going on outside of you is going to be altered. This is an inside job. Stop uh, blaming the whole world for something that you brought to the table. I can go on and on, but let me bring this to an end. The first Adam fell. And when he fell, he did not fall from a natural realm, he fell from a spiritual realm where he, his thinking, he was thinking from this superior paradigm. It was a paradigm of dominion. It was a paradigm of creativity. It was a paradigm of innovation. And when he fell, he fell and it caused the fatal flaw to happen to all humanity, not just to some, all humanity. And so we've been thinking from an inferior level ever since then. Doesn't matter how many degrees you have, it's the fatal flaw. And we're sinned of the bound, grace does that much more bound. Adam did this, took humanity into a different operating way of operating, shifted uh, humanity's operating system. That was the first Adam. But when the second Adam came, he came to reset humanity's operating system at the level of thinking. So the first Adam fell and began to think from this inferior paradigm. But through the parabolic teaching, the second Adam 
gives us a hard reset, gives us the ability to pivot, gives the ability, us the ability to have this paradigm shift, to think differently, to think from a superior realm of domin dominion that gives us critical thinking, that gives us the ability to tap into, listen to this, the faculties of innovation. And this is so important. I call this revelation of elevation. When Adam fell, he lost touch with, with everything that made him powerful. He lost touch with his psychological congruency. He had no congruency whatsoever. He began to reject the monster that he thought was without side of him, but it was actually inside of him. He made a decision and he blamed it on his wife. Number two, he, he lost touch with his individuation or his individuality. He became enmeshed in other people's opinion and other people's thoughts and other people's feelings. He lost touch with his uniqueness. He lost touch with his identity. He lost touch with social healthiness. He lost touch with physical and spiritual and economic and financial wholeness. He lost touch with his intellectual capacity. He lost touch with the ability to tap into the mind of God. It was God that said, I know the thoughts I think towards you, thoughts of good, good, not of and, not thought, thoughts of good, not of evil to bring you to the expected. And he lost touch with the innovative, uh, cutting edge thinking that was made available. He lost touch with his divine genius. What he didn't know, he had instant connection with the mind of with the mind of God who gave him downloads with witty inventions and with creative ideas and he lost touch with his spiritual connectivity and this is what happened why does Jesus teach in parables. He teaches in parables because it puts us back in touch with our humanity. The more human you are, the more intelligent you are, the more human you are, the more powerful you are. What is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man that thou shalt visit him? You made him a little lower than angels, not a little lower than animals. God does not use an orangutan or a monkey to compare you with. He uses angels. And if you think and be risen with Christ, you've got to be able to seek those things which are above and seek those things which are not beneath. He wants to put you back in touch with who you really are. Let's pray. Our Father and God, even as we begin uh, our teaching on the parables of Christ, I pray that you would bless us, that you would anoint us, that you would give us the ability to really think not to be controlled by propaganda, not to be controlled by lies or deceit, not to be controlled by other people's opinion of you, but truly we would have the mind of Christ so that we can have the restoration of our thinking. Now unto him who is able to do the exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think, it's according to the power that works in us. Amen. Hey everyone, this is Cindy Trim, and I just wanted to say that I'm so excited that you're here at my one and only official YouTube channel. We post content frequently to keep you inspired, encouraged, and always empowered. When you subscribe to my channel, it helps get the message of hope around the world. If you've been uh, ever impacted by our content in any way, please let us know in the comments section. I'd love to do life with you and I love reading your comments and don't forget to share it with a friend. We also want to take a moment to thank you for all your support of the ministry with your donations and offerings, with your phone calls and with your prayers. You help to keep the ministry going. When you give, I believe God will open up the windows of heaven. You'll see his favor in new ways in your life, in your family's life. And I know something, and I'm coming into agreement with you now that your best days are still ahead of you. So be sure to subscribe, like, and share. We love you, and we'll see you the next time. The Cindy Trim Ministries app just got even better. Dive into the brand new experience right now by updating or downloading the latest version of the app for free in the Apple or Google Play Store. 
The dynamic home screen keeps you up to date with the latest empowering articles, sermons, live streaming services, and a weekly arrangement of the most inspiring content available anywhere. Watch on-demand messages and begin leading your empowered life group today. Sign up now and receive your how-to handbook and discussion guides for each message. There's more empowerment at every click. Engage in the latest events hosted by Dr. Trim and find out when she's coming to a city near you. We've even made giving easier than ever before. You can donate now by selecting the Give button inside of the app. After creating your profile, giving will be as simple as putting in an amount and selecting Donate. Download the Cindy Trim Ministries app now and begin your journey of empowerment with us today.